Welcome to this month's edition of Disc Golf Monthly. This month, we will feature some of the best moments of the show with our former host, Carl Cubbage, who tragically passed away this past year. Carl began hosting the program back in 2008. One of the first shows that he hosted was the Final Nine Round at the Duck Golf Tournament at Burke Lake. Let's take a look. Golf on a hot day like today. Yeah, you really don't feel it, you know? It's... There's the leader with another roller. It's a strong one. Boy, it eats up the fairway, I can tell you that. He's in a fine spot. Roller there. Matt, what does a player want to use for a roller for someone just starting out? Well, when you're just starting out, I'd look for something that's the most beat up disc in your bag, you like a stingray. Or even a beat up cheetah. We're talking a distance for a right hander that goes way to the right. Yeah, the absolutely. Or for a left hander that goes way to the left. Something that really goes that way would be a great roller to start out with. It's all about getting the angle and lining it up from where you're throwing and find a landing spot and let it go. But Tony takes the air route. Trying to get around there. In a tough spot. JG trying to see if he can seize the opportunity, perhaps pull into a second place tie. Let's it go. And it dropped. Just dropped. Here's our leader. He had a strong drive here. You're just looking not to make any mistakes. Well, he still pumps it out there. Boy, man. he rips it. He really skied it out there. Coming around. You should have a look. And there's Eric. And run between the raindrops. Sends that one high, curling around. Coming in. You should have a look. There's Tony. Look, look at this basket. Nice look of OB right behind it. A little tough to see those cars going behind you. Movement is usually the thing that bothers uh, this golf. Is yeah, up. you know, um, if you've played here enough, and Tony has, you get used to it. Kind of time it and, you know, look at the basket. Focus on the pole. It's the only, only thing you're doing. Oh, oh thought he had it. Mm. to the basket again. Uh, hard to tell when he releases that. It's an interesting style. Ian with a chance for a birdie three. Oh. That one just got caught a little bit high. Matt, yeah, he hit chance. that just a little high, a little left. See if Eric can bag three here. Oh, he oh, caught the, come up up the basket Boy, the no birdies there. Nothing but fours. And I think the only thing we got left to see who's going to end up in the second place at this point. And it's close between Tony and John for second. Yeah. Ian is just playing flawless. Yeah, even with that missed putt, you know, that, he's been strong all day. All right, Matt, basket E, par three, 388 feet. This is a tough one. It's, it's back there. It's yeah, well protected. Time, it's it's going to take a strong drive. These guys are you know, a little tired. Last hole. I don't think they're going to hold anything back. A strong drive. You can definitely get a deuce on this hole. Filter. Oh, caught the... It's still flying. It still flew through there. Oh, it's a beauty. That was nice. That's a beautiful shot. He's going to have a look at it. Back in these trees, they're going to try to play down this right side of this fairway and have it fade into the left. Hopefully, give him a look. Don't want to go too far left. There is OB. Sends it out there. Oh. He catches a branch. And our leader. Well, Ian, very comfortable. Really showcased his skills here today, Ben. Yeah, he put on 
quite a performance, and I think the turning point in his final nine here was that second shot roller that he threw after he rolled OB and came back in, and, and he absolutely got a three when he had to. And I think sometimes those shots are the shots that keep your round going. You have a good round going, you hit that tough par three, you know, you get a really tough three. All right, that's going a little bit wide. That, uh, it's I kept think that's fading. in somebody's picnic area there. Well, Tony's got a birdie putt here. This is uh, not a piece of cake, you know, as you can see the OB road right behind it. And it's been raining, the rain's picking up. This could seal second place for him. And there it is. Nice job. Nice round, Tony. Way to throw. He tried, but, you know, Ian was just too much. That three shot lead was very vital going into this final night. Absolutely. Watch John make another run to the basket. Jump. Here it comes. And it caught a tree, and that helped bring it back a little bit. You'd have to give a ruling. All right, we're looking for a ruling here. Looks like the uh, the disc is in the uh, picnic area. It's under the picnic table, huh? Time to grab a soda, maybe a sandwich while you're there, Matt. Because he played sober. He can move in one box. <laughs> well, he wasn't drinking, so tell him that. That's a temporary obstacle. Park bench is always here. Park bench is there, so you can play it. Yeah, anything that stays here when we leave, we can't touch. Hey, Andy, you got a five dollar bill in here. I can move the cards out of the way. You know, it's right next to this guy's bag with money hanging out of it. That's not mine. All right, under the canopy, it's dry. Staying dry. Staying dry. A nice view. Let's see if we can get it. Oh, not, oh. Oh, rolled a little bit. He rolled a little bit, but he should be okay. JG with his par putt. It's all academic now. He's not going to end up in second. Not going to get there. He's going to oh, end up in third. Oh, he caught the uh, Finishes up. Eric makes the three. Fine on, showing. And goes from fourth place. And here's the leader for the win. And he does. Nice, nice job, Ian Liddell. What an exciting tournament that was, as it ended with Ian Liddell mastering the course for the win. Next, we're going to move on to coverage from the 87th program. We brought you the tragic story of Brent Hambrick, who lost his life to cancer at a very young age. But things took a dark turn for Brent as he went to play a tournament in Louisville, Kentucky with his girlfriend, Mackenzie. His passion for the sport was so great that he figured, you know, if my time is short, I'm gonna use it to the way I wanna use it. And so he continued to play disc golf uh, to, to his ability as far as, you know, what his body would allow him to do. I mean, he, he went to tournaments where a couple times, once in Louisville, he literally almost died, and he probably would have uh, one night in a hotel room in Louisville, except his girlfriend woke up and, you know, discovered him pretty much passed out, and he was just, you know, very strong-willed, and he was going to do what he wanted until his time, you know, was over. In 1997, the disc golf community was not as large as it is today, and players had to travel a lot to get to play tournaments, which meant that everyone knew everyone. Everybody knew that he was down in Kentucky, knew that he was trying to play, and, uh, and then everybody heard that, you know, they, they found him on the floor in the, in the motel room in Kentucky, and they brought him back home here, and uh, he, just never, he, he just never could regain the strength and, and to fight it off. Brent shared his condition in a heartfelt letter that was even published in Disc Golf World News. In it, Brent let everyone know his situation with chemotherapy and how it would limit his life. He shared how being a member of the disc golf community saved him from becoming isolated from friends and thanked everyone who had been supportive of him. He even joked about offering up his convertible Z28, which he had loved so much. Although Brent accepted what his future was to be, he was determined to live his life the way he wanted. He was bedridden for the most part, I think, and we get into his house and he gets up out of bed plays pool with us. Actually shot a game of pool with us and his mom was there and she just sat in the corner and I, I can vividly remember her saying he hasn't done that in a long time. Her comment that he's just doing it for you guys, like he's just showing off like he does, you know, and, and making you guys think he's fine. But 
I think it was shortly thereafter, I don't know how long, but it couldn't have been more than a week that he actually passed. At the age of 34, on August the 6th, 1997, the disc golf community and the world lost Brent Hambrick. I got up and went in and he said, this is it, Mom. And I said, how do you know? And he didn't describe it. He just said, this is it. This weekend, yeah. Brent Hambrick. The loss of a good friend and fellow disc golfer was hard for many. It was a hard thing to deal with. He was a very good friend. Um, I spent a lot of time with him. I traveled the country with him. So to not have him around was definitely something that uh, took quite a bit of getting used to. Uh, I got married in October of 97 and Brent was supposed to be my best man. So it was a, uh, a tough thing to deal with. In Brent's memory, his ashes were spread at various places that were very meaningful to him. His best friend, Dan Busick, traveled to spread Brent's ashes in many of these places. I was fortunate enough to be able to take uh, one of the boxes and sprinkle them off the top of Half Dome as well as off the top of the world at Del La Viega. Brent's ashes were also spread at the renamed Brent Hambrick Memorial Course at a tree planted in his honor by his favorite hole, Hole 8. The club rallied to keep his memory alive. On October 18, 1997, the first annual Brent Hambrick Memorial Open was held. There were 125 disc golfers, some traveling from afar to celebrate the life of Brent Hambrick. Or somebody dug holes all around the tree and all of the cards and get well cards and everything that he was given, she shredded up and we all like, you know, put them in, the, in little holes and then, then everybody had the opportunity to spread some of his ashes around there and it was just so meaningful. Fifteen years after the loss of Brent, his spirit continues to live on as the Columbus Flyers were born. One thing that came about after his death was everybody rallied and we got the Columbus Flyers Disc Golf Club together. I think we all felt the need to carry on Brent's passion and, and I really do attribute the club being in existence to his passing. Every year since Brent's passing, the club has hosted the Brent Hambrick Memorial Open in his honor. Each year, the Columbus Flyers aims to raise as much money as possible for the benefit of cancer research and for those currently needing treatments. Tournament director Paul Jay is one who is very instrumental in making sure his memory is kept alive. With it being 15 years, I think there's so many newcomers that come on and they don't really know Brent. Once they get here for a year or two and they hear Paul in the players' meeting and they hear Paul's mission and, and the past tournament directors that have run this tournament, they've always preached, you know, this is for Brent, you know, we're doing this for Brent. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has volunteered at the event and appreciates the impact the financial donation event proceeds makes to help in the fight against cancer. They've helped us for the last several years. We come and help volunteer for the event, and in return they donate money, which again goes toward the James Cancer Clinic to help fight blood cancers. The charity aspect of it, we take a, a lot of pride in. Since, you know, since 97, we raised over $40,000 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and, and we, we really hang our hat on that. This year is a special year for keeping the memory of Brent Hambrick alive, as Brent has been selected to have his memory preserved at the Disc Golf Hall of Fame. The induction ceremony will take place during the 2011 Worlds this year in Santa Cruz, California. Brent's passion for the game and his spirit not to allow cancer affect that passion will always be admired. He will always be remembered by keeping the dream of furthering the sport of disc golf alive. And I think we started Thanks, something. Well, that was a very moving story on a very inspirational human being. Now we're going to move on to coverage from the 94th show at the Eric C. Yetter Champions Cup as Steve Brinster made a miraculous comeback on the back nine of the last round to force a playoff with Jeremy Colling. Jeremy Colling won the tournament after several holes into the playoff. Let's take a look at some of those memories. 
261 feet. Steve Brinster, Jeremy Coling, game on. It's always exciting to see you play off. Get a lot of spectators. Big gallery to follow you. And Steve puts it right there at the basket. That's got to put some pressure on Jeremy, who's oh. playing this course for his first time. You can't have a better shot than that. The only better shot than that is in the hole. Jeremy with that smooth release. Wow, that's not bad. He's not got bad a decent look himself. One tree and he'd have been out of it. I think the fans are in for a, tr a treat here. This is no gimme, by the way, Tom. Playoff, a little bit of pressure. A nice wow. pop. Smooth cans the deuce. That's great. Well played hole by both. Steve with the drop in here for the birdie. All right, so a pair of birdies there as we move on. Good start. Tom, we're basket two, par three, 434 feet. It's downhill through the chute. We just saw it. Steve's putting a towel down, so he's got some good footing there, which is allowed by the rules. Steve's going to play a backhand. A lot of guys will throw an understable shot so that it turns over toward the bottom and it falls back toward the hole. Not sure what steep disc, what disc he's playing. Well, he oh. caught a tree and that kicked it to the right. Yep. He's in the center. Not bad position. Jeremy, we know he's throwing the forearm. Pumps it down there. He's holding the line. Let's see if he can back. penetrate. Okay, Steve's got a few trees to work his way through. And he does so nicely. A nice skip there. Puts it right at the basket. Wow, if Jeremy could can this one, the playoff would be done. Chance to win it right here. Oh, gave it a run. Had a good line, just a little bit low, but we're going to see the playoff extended to another hole as the players get their pars and move on. Still tied, going to the third playoff hole here, Tom. Right, we saw Steve play this hole and birdie it last time. Let's see if he can pull that Basket off Basket three, the par five, 797 feet. This is long. Gotta stay in the fairway. You can cut the tension with a knife here, Tom. Steve sends it off. Nice putts fading toward the OB, though. That it looks like we might have an out-of-bounds there, Tom. Tough break. Did go out-of-bounds. Jeremy heading that way as well, but let's see if his can break back. Yeah, the forearm should come back inbounds. He skips, skips off the OB and then comes back in. Oh. What a tough break there. Steve on his third throw. Let's not count him out. It's almost the identical shot as, as last time. Takes a different route, though. All right, tough break there. <laughs> Jeremy is not out of the uh, trouble. He's got a tough stance and some stuff to clear. Yeah. Threads it through nicely and gets some distance sure out of that one, Tom. Yeah. That's good position at the bottom of the hill. He'll have a nice look up at the hole. That is Steve in the thick of it there. Caught some branches coming out. Got out well, pulled it a little bit. 
Jeremy down on his knee with for a forehand approach. Okay, Slides it up three. close. Steve needs this pot for the par. Nice answer. Nice to done, Steve. All right, well, right here, if Jeremy makes this one, the playoff will be over and we will have a new champion. Something tells me Jeremy's going to make this putt. It's uh, pretty easy for his caliber player. He's been solid, but the pressure of a playoff. But he executes, and he wins the 19th year of the uh, Eric C. Yetter Champions Cup with a great playoff against Steve Brinster. What an exciting finish to a playoff of one of the most challenging courses on the East Coast. In the summer of 2015, Disc Golf Monthly covered the Pro Worlds, and the final nine round that took place at Slippery Rock University was one to remember. Let's take a look. Looks like it got away from him a little. Uh -huh. Somebody got tagged. <laughs> Not happy with that one. <laughs> Hits two trees. This looks pretty nice. <laughs> right there. Steve with the backhand. Sends it up high and to the right. Is it going to hold the line? A little skip away. Come on. Oh. Almost got it. He curls around the right side. Steve with a little work. Wow. So, see, I think that, like I said, he doesn't get that momentum when he's inside of 30. Tough break there. Such a nice drive by Will. Yeah, that was a boomer. Will with the birdie there. Only two strokes separate uh, Ricky and Will. We're on to basket 12, C position, par four, 830 feet. Last hole. Last chance saloon here, Jimmy. Sent it down the left side. <laughs> Sorry, he came, came out of it. This is just another show off hole. How far can I throw? Paul sent it up there. Somebody's yelling, get in the hole. Yeah, I don't think you can throw that far. He threw pretty far, though. <laughs> Whoa, it just landed. There's oh, a nice go, shot go. by Steve yeah. Brinster. Yeah, Brinster. That's a beaut. Yeah,
Ball was caught on the left hand side, sends it down. Go in, get in. Oh, get in. Go get in. Go in. Go oh, in. look at that oh. tough roll away he had. Almost canned it. Oh, you got to go for that. I mean, it's absolutely it's a great play. finish there. Nice, Will Schuster. Great, great worlds. Hold back. Ricky from down below. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Brinster finishes up. All right, here we are, our 2015 PDGA Professional Disc Golf Men's Open World Champion for the fourth time, Paul Macbeth. Well, that was quite a memorable look back from coverage from a great host and friend of the show. We will deeply miss Carl Cubbage, his sense of humor and passion for the game of disc golf. Well, that's all the time we have for this one show. Thank you for joining us on Disc Golf Monthly, the show that takes you one step closer to the sport of disc golf. student have in common? They've all recovered from a mental health problem, and they're all part of our lives. Mental health problems are surprisingly common. They affect almost every family in America, maybe even yours. Get the facts about mental health. Call 1-800-789-2647, because mental health is part of all our lives.